Um, we can start, I believe. Hi, everyone. Good evening, all. Uh, it's a privilege to have uh, Ishrak uh, today with us. So he said, Sidecore MVP. She'll take us through the webinar on tips and tricks for building accessible Sidecore solution. On behalf of Sukh Chennai, welcoming Ishrak to the webinar. So extending my warm welcome to all the participants. So over to Ishrak. We are very excited to hear from you. All right. Thank you so much, as always, for having me, and thanks everyone who's joining. And let's just get started with um, why we went through, you know, focusing on this topic a little bit. Um, so I'm going to jump about these things and just directly right to the topic. So true story. So if you don't mind, can you please talk a little bit louder? It's hard to hear you. A little bit. Louder. Is it not clear? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. So one of the main reason uh, that I've actually took some sort of like um, a stand and, and a step back and started to go back and reevaluate our understanding of accessibility and like the importance of making sure that we actually build for inclusivity and for diversity in like whatever website that we're building, right? With whatever brand is the fact that um, during the past two years with Corona and, and everything, you can see that there has been a huge shift towards working online, right? Now working from home, working remotely is just becoming business as usual. In the past, it has been a challenge. It has been something that's not easy for everyone to do. While now, it's almost everything is done online. Uh, and I recall it during the lockdown and uh, the period of times where we were unable to go physically anywhere. Um, you can see, especially from the governmental websites, right? From the activities that you have and that need require you to go to a bank or to the government or anywhere um, they were struggling and in, shifting into it right it took them time and it it, it it seems like it's been abruptly moving from almost having a website that's a support for the physical kind of a service into having everything now then over the service of, of the services online um, one of the clients that we were working with for the past two years they are a commerce website so they have a different brands they have different franchises and each franchise has their own websites and we're talking about products right and they have more than fifty thousand images for one of their brand and one of the first thing that if you throw this question to anyone and ask about uh, if i want to make sure that the website is accessible what comes first to your mind. First thing that comes to mind is at least make sure that the image is displayed and the website has an alt image, right? So as Selbil and as revealed that thing, um, when we went back and looked into the media library, more than I think 70% of these images did not have uh, an alt image. And it's not only having any kind of a text, right? It has to be sensible kind of a text. It has to be clear enough to convey what the message of this. So if I look into this image, well, how can I describe that in a way if someone uh, were not able to see this image, they would understand that. So it was not as simple as just running a PowerShell script, right? And go through all the images and copy the name of that image. Because we all know how media items are uploaded to to the media library, right? They are not necessarily created in a very uh, understandable or meaningful kind of a name. And on top of that, you have to go through your solution, check all the components that uses images, and make sure it's actually implemented in a way where it would actually um, render an image tag, right? So, sorry, an alt tag. So you can imagine the amount of time needed amount of effort neither then on top of that the money that has been put just to make sure this uh or these images actually have 
an alt tag. So a research or a study by Web AM showed that back in 2020, more than 98% of the world top 1 million websites did not offer full accessibility. So this means in a different way, like only 2% of these websites are actually inclusive or takes disability in, into account and they use that as a competitive advantage. And I think some of the struggles were um, when you go back to the business to your client and you discuss the importance of implementing accessibility or making sure your website would be inclusive, would be used by anyone regardless of their um, way or their need for accessibility. And it's not like when you release a new functionality, so you see something new on the website, right? It's not like you're fixing a bug so you can measure. Accessibility, it's one of these activities such as uh, personalization or marketing. It, it's not easy to directly go and find a metric or a measure of um, the impact of having accessibility to your website. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, that from a three different perspective. One from a strategic perspective. So when we're building our strategy to the website, whether it's a digital strategy, it's marketing strategy, some of the things that we need to keep in mind and to always put in the back of our head whenever we think about creating a digital strategy from a design perspective and finally from an implementation perspective, because that's like the huge aspect of building this as a whole. So if we take a step back and try to understand or challenge our understanding for accessibility, and first thing that almost always comes to mind is permanent physical impairments, right? You would think someone who won't be able um, to walk or would be able to see or would have issues, you know, interacting with their hands. This is the first thing that comes to mind when, it's, when we talk about accessibility. However, the domain or the impact of that is a little bit more than that because disability or the need for accessibility comes from different ways and a different um, kind of way. So it could be physical as mentioned, could be sensory, so be able to see here, or could be cognitive. Sometimes they would use the, like a thick accent as some sort of a barrier um, when communicating with websites. So that actually is considered an accessibility need. Could be permanent, could be a temporary, someone get injured during an accident, could be situational. And I like this example they use like a mom, uh, she's holding her kid and trying to work on her mobile. So it's actually a situation. She's not um, someone from our traditional understanding of disability has, but she has a situation that prevents her from using everything that she can to interact with your website or with your mobile app or whatever you have. So another example, if we want to extend our understanding of this, if we look into the pavements, right? At the end of the pavement we have at the curb, um, there is like the pavement is, is like this and then at the end you have this very steep um, kind of an access to it, right? Um, and we always look at that as an entrance for people with wheelchairs. But look today who's using these uh, these entrance or accessibility access points to the pavements we have. Uh, parents with strollers, we have travelers with um, with their bags, right? Or even we have bicycle riders if they're using the pavement for whatever reason. But you can stretch your imagination to the benefits. And what does that mean for me as a business? If I look into it from not only this narrow kind of understanding, but more into its bigger scale and bigger impact and how much of new opportunities and new advantages we are going to uncover. So first of all, as mentioned, extend and expand your understanding of disability or need as, as a concept. Second thing, get familiarized with these with these things, right? Because we actually already have like a web or digital standards for accessibility and we have a lot of them. This is just a sample of that. 
And it's really important to understand that different industries could have even different kind of compliance with these with these standards. Sometimes it could be like lenient, they could just require level one. Sometimes it could be uh, they have to have, for example, the WCAG AAA standard. So government, education, commercial sites, they have a different kind of com com uh, compatibility uh, with these standards or um, they have to be compliant with these things. So keep in mind that it could be as simple as an entry level, could be as extensive level. And that's really important to identify from the beginning, even before you look into your design, you know that we need to be compliant with this level of standards. So when you design your website, when you have your team implement the website, it's already part of your backlog, right? It's not an afterthought. It's not something that we're going to come later and, and fix. It's actually normalized as a standard procedure in your uh, way of thinking. Um, just to have a little bit deeper understanding of these principles, if we take the web content um, accessibility guideline and principle, we just like put that from a, a four different kind of a guidelines. And if you think about that, it can uh, give you the breadth of where to look, how to look, and how to put that into context. So one of the guidelines is perceiv being perceivable. So this is intended to support users who have difficulty with senses. Maybe sound, could be sight, could be touch. So they are in need of assistive technology to help them interact with your website. So how can I make sure when someone is using their reader device, they're able to go through each section and the page and be able to interact with my website. Um, operability. So that's uh, making sure that the website is operable for the users who have motor difficulties. So we have some of them that may rely on a keyboard. So as trivial as it is for us, when we implement this website, we won't think about the tabs most of the time. Like if I am using the tab to navigate from one section to the other from my navigation in the menu. Um, how does that gonna impact those who rely on a keyboard to do it? As simple as my menu, if I go through my navigation menu, would that go through like the tab would jump from first level kind of navigation, menu one, menu two, menu three, or it's gonna go through menu one and it's children, menu two and it's children. And when we start to think about that, you can, start noticing that's not only implementation, how am I going to do it? But also from a design perspective, how can I design it in a way it's gonna be easier for implementation and for the users as well. Understandability, same thing. If I visit a website and I'm looking through the various components in a page, it should be done in a very consistent and a clear way where I don't have actually to think in order to understand what I'm being presented with, right? So if I am using a form, it should include everything that I need to go through from one step to the other. If I'm going through the checkout process, it should have a clear instructions where the reader, for example, can help me read step by step, navigate from one chicken checkout process um, to the other with ease. So this sounds like more of like a usability kind of uh, understanding, but like any usable website most likely is going to be inherently accessible. So that's also um, a value added. And finally, being robust. So being robust means um, the site I am using eventually is going to be con consumed by different devices, right? So support for HTML for all of these standards should be just as simple as out of the box. So maybe today we're not uh, going to be uh, compliant with accessibility rules, but we are building towards that. So eventually in the page, I'm going to have like um, a text reader, right? So a speech recognition where if you click on one place and any paragraph in the site, there's going to be speech uh, recognition for this text. And it could be as simple as just having a plugin on your website or JavaScript or any building. Uh, library that you can inject into your website and that works. 
but we don't want to be halfway through the website or going back to the website where I need to go back and change the HTML or change the way it's been implemented just because it does not support standards like that. So these are things that we need to keep in mind when we are designing for accessibility. From a personalization perspective and, and during the strategy, this is why I, uh, I always like come back to personalization when someone is trying to batch their uh, how we are going to actually normalize accessibility and this is not an afterthought or something that uh, we need to plan to it should be just something it's similar to how we build our website all the process all the steps um, when we build for accessibility and remember when we said like 98 percent of people are missing on that opportunity because they do not have a full kind of uh, of a full accessibility support so we're if we are implementing that we're even included to our kind of audience now the disability the disabled community right or those who might not be using the mobile now or their website because they've been into an accident and they can't interact with the website temporarily because they've been in that situation. So I'm losing on that opportunity. But if I'm implementing that, again, remember the pavement uh, example, I'm introducing a new audience to myself. I'm in uncovering new channels to my website. I recall um, last year when I was looking into analytics um, for one of the websites that I've worked on for tourism. And one of the channels when you look into the, uh, the sidecore analytics was a reader. So um, it was like really fulfilling to know that, and we did not even think about that. Every time we look, we would see the conversion between desktop and mobile, right? We want to make sure our website is respons responsive enough to easily and seamlessly be working on the mobile, but we never thought about that. But the minute we've um, seen that reader as one of the channels, it made us rethink and go back and make sure, yeah, Maybe we need to test that against the reader and make sure everything is working as expected. So that's another kind of a drive to your traffic, right? It's a new channel coming to your way. It helps with the conversion. It helps with your ranking in SEO. So this is one of the KBIs that can be presented um, to the client or to your management as like we, we can have a measure uh, to the impact of putting these in place, supporting accessibility. And we can actually measure that maybe in not a conventional way, but it's definitely going to show. Some of the common accessibility issues are how can we like think about it like this, always think about it as an embedded accessibility. It's not something you want to be consciously looking at. It should be something built within your own process. Um, scanning your website for accessibility. Remember when um, when we do a release, right? After the deployment, one of the first things that we go and check for is performance. We want to make sure that the new introduced functionality does not cause the site performance to degrade, right? So this is going to be the same. Think about it in a way where every time I'm going to do a release, I want to go and scan my website, make sure the accessibility the work that I've been doing has not been broken by introducing a new functionality or a new content, both an accessibility notice. And you're going to start to see some of these brands or websites, they have a dedicated page called accessibility. And you would see that, especially with the governmental website, they would have a page listing, where did they implement accessibility, how they can use it. And sometimes it could be as simple as just acknowledging that we know that we have accessibility issues in the website and we are working on that or we are aware of it but just like showcase that we do care we're working on it and sometimes providing an email or a phone number where people can contact you about accessibility stuff showcase that yeah we're building our website for inclusive uh set a policy and control it um i like this example if we think about that maybe during your workflow, right? You can introduce in the workflow a new step regulatory or whatever. So once everything is done and before it's going into publish, we make sure everything being published into the website. 
assisted against accessibility. Because from a functionality wise, your QA team could be able to always when they test uh, with test against device, uh, desktop, we test against mobile, then we can test against the reader. But you can't control like what content authors would do when they just go and do authoring. And we all been in situations and discussions with content author who would ask for more control uh, on HTML. Sometimes they want to embed their own JavaScript for a campaign, for example. They want to add a tool. They want to add an HTML into rich text editor. So this is one of the ways that you can challenge them into making sure that they are doing this with full awareness that bringing an HTML from a third party or a, a tool that can inject something into the current website it should go through the process. It should be compliant. Evaluating your CMS built-in features. And, and this is pretty much true. If you look into Sitecore now, many of the websites were using SXA, right? And as many of you have seen SXA grow uh, over time and have done the same. And I'm extremely happy to see between earlier version of SXA and even until like support with nine and now with 10, um, many of the out-of-the-box SXA components actually supports accessibility. If you look into the HTML or the way the template has been created, um, it's going to showcase that. And we're going to look into it uh, when we work on the implementation part of that. And sharing that information with content authors, as mentioned, um, make sure that whatever process that you end up doing, whatever kind of direction you're going with everyone in your team are aware of that it's not only your dev team it's not only your care team but your content team as well uh, are a huge part of that designing for accessibility so studies say that more than 300 million people in the world have some sort of like uh, visually impaired. So it could be someone who's legally blind or someone who has less than 20 on 20 vision. So if we take that as one dimension, you can see the impact of that, the scale of, of people who have just like one dimension, which is just like vision. And we talked about accessibility from different way, from uh, physical impairment, cognitive impairment, and all of these kind of stuff. One of these things are the contrast, the contrast of your website color theme, contrast between the menu text and the background, the contrast of the images. And one of the things that we've been working a lot on recently with many of these websites, they want to be um, compatible and uh, compliant is that tool, this one where you have uh, the ability to switch between colors or to switch between night vision, which is like a, a, a blue white kind of um, of a setup, right? Because many of us, uh, we work with the brands that they have the color as an integral part of their brand identity. And sometimes the these colors drive everything they do from merge to their digital presence and everything. But as mentioned, not everyone would be able to see that or be able to interact with that. Some people are colorblind. How can we help them distinguish or look into the website? Some of them might have some sort of a high uh, responsive for very light images. In, and many of us would go into a website that has a very black background and white text or whatever and starts to blink and this kind of stuff. So, we need to be conscious about that and give them the option if they are unable to or be comfortable working with the website with its full brand identity, they have the option to switch back into more like a tuned kind of a theme. Keyboard support, as mentioned, that's a huge, a huge um, part of the accessibility work that we're doing. Users with dyslexia and this is a funny um, thing that I've learned because I never thought about that before. So those who have dyslexia, especially if we take the date format, right? We always have these debates on how we are going to display that date. 
is it gonna be uh, day year month month day year it's different from one country to the other or culture to the other and are we going to say it with the text or with the number but we never thought that these users who have dyslexia if you shorten if you display that as an abbreviation november 8th or 8th of november and this kind of stuff they have difficulty reading these kind of numbers and dealing with data from that sense so once you recognize that that's actually we have a certain um people who would have difficulty to read something like that it makes you rethink so during your design it's no longer about how am i going to make the date look like from one country to the other but how it's easy to read how it's going to be presented in a way that everyone can understand it without having difficulty to read as, as something as simple as a date so that extra consciousness around how different people interact with with the website can help a lot from that sense interactive elements and um, think about the carousel uh, and the hero right or when you land on the home page and the video starts to play again certain people might not be able to be as quick enough or might need more time to look at that slide and interact with it so it's really important from a design perspective that we provide all the needed elements in, the, in these components to help them navigate to help them pause uh, even if someone would think from an aesthetic view like it's not gonna look nice or it's not gonna blend within my overall vision of the design of the site you can always build it in a way that give that option to them it should be usability over just having nice stuff uh, creating design for different uh, viewboards or sizes again um, i think this is something uh, we've been doing for way too long now and just adding the readers or a different kind of portables that many people would be using that should be something that we design against um, we've went through this uh, for example if you have a look into this is one of the tools that can help with um, identifying the accessibility issues we're going to talk about these various tools in a bit for example it identified we have a contrast issue between the background and the home like this link so if you look at that it would be very hard to distinguish the text from the background so tools like this can help you directly um, analyze and figure out what issues uh, that you can have um, so again when we think about design when we think about visualization when you're building your brand identity there's a different ways where you can um, build it in a way that actually is helpful for everyone and take for example if for those because we see it a lot when these brands or websites puts a campaign right or an ad on the home page but the quickest way for them to do that many of them would just give you an image with a text embedded within that so it's, the hair component is not like uh, implemented as a background image and you have a text and you have a cta they give you everything within that and they ask you to have that entire banner to be clickable now that could be for someone who's looking into that like this as easy as just interacting with it but they're just not taking into account that someone with a reader if they go and look into that image it would be meaningless because the text is not built in a way where the reader would be able to read the text on that image for them they gonna in this case rely on having that image have a very descriptive alt text or has a tool to read what has been embedded within that image so this is just an example and you can think um, about uh, lots of these examples and some of that we put a, a huge reliance on colors to convey messages if if it's red if it's green we know it could be like um, go or stop it could be go left or right or whatever right we understand that but for people with um who are colorblind they won't be able to interact with that that's why whenever we see like a green 
or red you would see like a tick or you would see an x because that's like an additional added value it could be for someone who'd say like no it's gonna end up be enough to just choose an a color but that's not always the case because we're just um not supporting the segment of people with color blind and i think just always take into account the culture of the website where it's going to be used uh going to talk about localization in a bit but um i remember like the traffic light right we have it's always red green in germany they have these lights that has like a picture of a guy who is wearing a hat so even in their culture when they look into the traffic light they're expecting to see that kind of an image or an icon inside the traffic light for us we don't even think about that and we build for almost the entire world we build the websites to be globally so an important aspect to think about always when we design is the support of localization and it's not only making sure that you can translate your content right because the content can be built and make sure that it's transla translatable but that means every single label every single alt text of then if an image every single hyperlink if we have that text added into it it should be built in a way that could be translatable because these readers will be when switching the languages so i'm switching from english to chinese the expectation for me is to read that text in chinese and not in english right so same thing making sure everything is as translatable as it can be um nowadays we have all the capabilities once i land on a website they would be able to detect my ib address and where i'm coming from so it's a good practice to always have that kind of a functionality so instead of um for example a user who needs an assistive device they use the reader to go and navigate the website and instead of jumping from all the navigation links in the menu, then going to the language switcher, switch the language. Or when they're presented with that pop-up, right? That ask them to select which market they want to go. You can imagine how many steps they need to do in order to go and select their language, right? While if we inherently, or like by default, it's built where it's as easy as everything is localized, you switch to your country. And then if you want to change that, then you do the extra step and navigate. Could be for us as, as simple as in the mouse, switch a link, but for many, it's just focusing and using on the keyboards and these shortcuts to navigate and go to the language switcher and do that. So accessibility testing tools we've been seeing, lot and lot of tools that are being used um, to help you test for accessibility some of them uh, for example like site improve it's a plugin it's a package can be installed in your site core website it has it needs a subscription so um, it typically not used by uh, by everyone but you always have these other tools like the wave tools this is the tool that i've been showing the screenshots from um, the IBM Equal Accessibility Checker, like it's a, it's an add-on to your browser. Same thing with Google Lighthouse and screen readers. You can always test against that while you're doing the, your development, um, because it's, it's as easy as when you're building uh, a web a page, right? We always say make sure everything is editable in the experience editor, right? You're always gonna open that page in the experience editor, make sure you're testing everything to be editable. We're just adding an extra step where that add-on can help you as simple as click on that uh, tool, run, it's gonna show you if you have an accessibility issue or not, just during your implementation before we jumping into the overall aspect of uh, the site. Now, um, I'm gonna call it accessibility checklist, you can call it whatever, but I've started to look into that as similar to the activities that I have before going live. So before launch, I have this checklist where I go into every single item in it and say like, yeah, we did the full site publish, we rebuilt the index. So I have this kind of um, uh, a checklist. It includes some of the activities that I would be looking at, just making sure um, from an accessibility point of view, we've covered as much as we can. 
to be compliant, even on a smaller scale or a larger scale. Um, the area or area, I don't know how we pronounce it, but you would start to see that when you get the HTML from the front end teams, right? You started to notice this tag and actually is an HTML semantics that helps the reader device to understand that piece of an HTML. So if we take this one, it says we have a span, an ID is a button, save an update. So one of the area labels that we can add to this button is a role. So when we click on that span, because a span, it's, it says a span, we're not defining our button as an actual input or a button from an HTML perspective. We're using that span instead. But then when we associate a role with it that says button, the reader would understand that we need to click on this span because it acts as a button. Same thing with this one. This is a button from an HTML perspective. It doesn't have an ID, it doesn't have a name. We don't know why this button has been used, right? We know from only click, it's used to close a dialogue. So we're adding an assistive kind of a code, which is, for example, in this case, an area label that says you close. So when the reader goes and read this HTML, it would say, we have a button, it's going to close a dialogue or, or whatever. So these um, semantics, like really very helpful for um, especially the, the readers to uh, understand the different HTML, the different components that we're working with. It doesn't have to always be in there. You could uh, work with um, different HTML where not everything is needed, but where it is needed, you can always uh, learn about it and use it. Uh, provide text for all non-text content, and this is um, a very, very uh, easy thing to do that we always neglect. As mentioned from the beginning, the alt tag for images. And Sitecore, we have that section in the media library that gives you the warning, right? Because it has, it is a mandatory. But if you go and save that media item, it's just going to save because it's not implemented as a required, but you, when you work on these templates and when you look, work with these images, just go ahead and change the mandatory uh, level for this field. So when the content author is saving that image, they won't be allowed until they are providing like a proper uh, alt text to an image. Same thing you can do when you're doing like a, a bulk import. Um, if we are looking into the image, uh, component in SXA. So in SXA, if I go to the image or the video, we will start to see that Sitecore has already supported the template for the image component with some of the fields that also help with accessibility. So we have a caption. So if you want to provide more assistive kind of a text to this image, you can add a caption to it. Same thing with the video. We have a, a, a video caption, the thumbnail, it will validate on the image. The video player, for example, you can say that there's a text displayed when the video is unavailable. Or what is the image that we want to show if the video is unavailable? And it's really important to think like from this perspective, because sometimes um, because we have a different kind of requirements when we are using the SXA components, we end up uh, extending these components, right? So always take into look and take into account if I go to the template of the image or video, how can I extend it in a way, reuse what Sitecore has and add on top of that, or learn how did they use it from an accessibility perspective when you build your own custom component. So these things, if you look at it now from this perspective, it would make a huge sense. And we did not see this um, before. So this is just applying the wave uh, tool on an image. So as just as simple as once I run that tool, it gave me a warning that this image is missing an alternative text. And if I look into my image, it would say like the alt is rendered already. So the component is built correctly, but I'm missing some content. So during testing and experience editor, just run that tool and it's going to show you exactly what's happening. Same thing with the video. You can see that they've already included the array label for the video player. Um, although like this is 
third-party tools. So it's really important when we think about reusing third-party tools, see to which extent it's accessible and provides also like an ultimate for the thumbnail. Ensuring that information structure can be separated from presentation. The hero example is an example on that where uh, the text is embedded within images. We try to make sure they are separated as much as we can. The structure of the HTML component, this is one of the highest errors that you would get if you have in the structure of your H tags, like an H6 comes before an H5. Again, this is a consideration like you might be able to control as much as you can within your page, but if you are providing a rich text editor for content author to add their own HTML, training them or teaching them to be conscious around these things, or maybe that workflow step can help ensure that the content that's been also created by the content author actually um, still consistent, because that H tag debate is a huge one. Same thing when we build the forms, we want to indicate we have a mandatory kind of a label or text. The color red or, or whatever is not always enough. Remember, people who are color blind, an extra uh, text saying that this is mandatory is also uh, helpful. Uh, one of the important things to understand, and this is, could be like a one activity you do it once and you learn it along the time or as you run the tool as much as you can again. And as I say, example, if I run the tool, uh, you would see that the header, the footer, my sections, and the side that comes from uh, the experience editor, they are already created in a way that we have an actual header tag and footer tag. So Sidecore took care of that. Um, but when I was building a page title, so you always think about page title to be H1 tag. When I added the page title to the page, one of the errors that I had was missing first level heading. So when I inspected the page header component from the SXA tool, I found out it's not using an H tag. So this is again, making the extra step to learn these components, how it's being rendered and not just like assume because it's a page title, it's automatically going to be rendered as an H1 tag. Allowing users to control time limits on their reading or interaction. Again, this is what we've mentioned about these uh, components that has a motion in the website, the carousel link, for example. So this is the carousel link from uh, the SXA. You see like it's empty link on the back and previous. So this component, it's using a third party tool, but it's missing like an area label for a previous and next. The tool would directly um, identify that and show you that, yeah, this is one of the components that we need to look at and uh, possibly refactor. Web pages have titles that describe a topic or purpose. Again, I think from an SEO perspective, most of the websites nowadays have already covered that. We always have a title in a content. The most important part is when we build these pages, we have the content author use the page level uh, fields to identify the page title, the browser title, whatever, wherever we're using the actual content of a page title or a content, right? I've seen um, like a lot of implementations where everyone is just shifted to work with data sources and they completely forgot that we still rely on page level fields to convey that messages and we can't just rely on creating another data source to provide that information. You already have that, use it, and it's help you. It's gonna help you from an accessibility and SEO perspective. Page navigation, um, based on logical order. We've mentioned the example for the menu. Same thing if you have a calendar and you're using the tab component to switch between different weeks or months or whatever. One thing I've noticed, you can see like, with Sidecore, they have already implemented the area label previous and next on, on the links. So it actually passed the test. And something similar we would need to do on the flip component or the uh, carousel and that kind of stuff. The primary natural language or languages has been programmatically determined. And this is what I've um, also discussed during the localization aspect of it. We already have the tool that helps us identify the language of the browser, right? The user where they're coming from. 
And Sidecore by default, if we're using the language switcher or if you just inspect the HTML, you would see that in the document, they've already added the language uh, based on what they have detected. So out of the box, we already have that free use, the tool as well. It's using that identification, just making sure we're leveraging that as well. And information that conveys um, the color is also evident without color. Again, always think about those who are colorblind or have issues interpreting uh, or understanding the meaning of a color, because even if we look from a cultural perspective, color, especially color, uh, if we take red or even a black, it could be interpreted in a different way from one culture to the other. So that's also a, an accessibility concern that we need to think about. Um, the purpose of each link can be determined from the link text. So remember when we add the link um, through, for example, the general link, and sometimes we would use that to add an email or a phone number. We need to make sure when we are using these fields to help render a phone to call or an email, if I go through that through the tab and I'm trying to understand through the reader, if, I, if I'm if i going to click on that link because it's going to redirect me, is it a navigation link? Or it's going to open an email for me to send an email or click on that for a phone. So that's, again, something that you won't be typically thinking about that when you're building that link or you're deciding how you are going to build or implement an send email link. But that's also something you need to think about if the reader is reading that, would, would that be able to understand that the purpose of this link has a different um, messaging or a different purpose? And maybe I don't want to rely on the text that's in the general link, and maybe I need to create another field that can be used for the area label, for example, that can help me understand um, the purpose around that. So these are some of the, let's say, common things or common practices to look at uh, when you work with uh, accessibility, when you're building your website. Um, again, with SXA, I had the opportunity to look into most of the components in, in the toolbox, and it's been really like very pleasant that most of that has been actually passing that accessibility test. If you think about the Sitecore forms, it's one of these components, when people started to think and talk about accessibility years ago, that was one of the first uh, areas we were looking at, at, right? Because the components are already also like built in. To which extent Sitecore had built that? And again, it could be from a single point of a standard that works as expected. But if we go and run the tool that, because we need to be compliant with a different standard, the HTML, the uh, the way the label is being grabbed around the, text, the single line text or we need to separate them, it could be different. So it's really important to understand that different standards or guidelines also might affect the way we're building HTML. And that could also affect out-of-the-box functionalities that we are getting out from, uh, from Sitecore. Um, as a final thought, there are some of the remediation challenges that we I went to throw when we were working on existing websites and we wanted to make sure everything is accessible. Again, uh, many of the things that we've discussed uh, touch point on if I want to build something new from scratch if, or if I want to go and check my existing website and component to see if it's compliant or not. Another thing, there's a challenge if you want to go this like a little bit back um, or late in the game, right? Because some of the things that we face, if we fix some of these accessibility, we were running the guidelines again against triple A uh, WCAG standard. And every time we run that tool, we fix something, it goes and uh, introduce a new accessibility issue. So if we would fix uh, a label on adding the area label into a component, then the tool would go and try to match the text between the area label and the actual label. And we find a discrepancy between them that would introduce a new issue. 
or that was not translatable, that was has been hard coded just in terms of, yeah, let's just create an area label and get done with it. But that did not take into account translation. So it introduces new and new bugs. Some of them actually caused a complete break in the functionality, especially if we were relying on very hard coded stuff in JavaScript or CSS. So that's another thing to look at. Um, such like the carousel, that one was using a third party plugin, or you might be using the share component from a third party tool. To which extent that tool itself is accessible? Sometimes, no matter what you try to get that perfect score, right? You would be fixing maybe at the end of the day 0.2 out of that issue, but then you have 0.8 still um, away from that just because we're using third party tools. So it's not about being 100% accessible or you get the perfect score it's trying to be in that position and next time when you think about using a third party tool or a community tool or anything of that think about these aspects and its impact on your accessibility um yeah the some of the examples of the tools that we've just discussed like opening uh, the browser a plugin or these some of these tools are done on a page by page uh, perspective, right? But when you have an entire website, you have lots and lots of products and catalogs and stuff, you want to run that tool on uh, the entire website. Your scale is the entire website. So sometimes you won't be able to validate that all the fixes, all the remediation work that your team has been doing has been actually done the correct way until you go and do a deployment to production. So that also came as a challenge because how many times they would think that yeah, we're done with this task and then we need to go to production and they think that, yeah, that task is not fixed. But it's not like that. Sometimes you need to go to production for that tool to work and assess a live site and second to do on scale. It's something in you for many developers, whether they're backend or frontend developers, just being familiarized and trained on working with that actually takes time. So. You need to give your time some slack when they work and learn about this and how they implement it. And finally, as mentioned from the beginning, sometimes it's not easy measured by the clients. <coughs> Sorry, so they won't be able to go and assess to which extent this is helpful for them, right? So metrics like the analytics, introducing a new channels, enhancing, uh, your your site ranking, um, it's SEO are some of the aspects that you can showcase and bring to the table and say, no, we can measure that in a different way other than just like the normal way of doing things. And that's it from my end. Any questions? Uh, thanks, Shrek. Uh, I have a question actually. Uh, so, for the screen readers, uh, like Wave, right? Do you suggest any screen readers uh, best? Yeah, no, I, I don't have any recommendation because it depends on which standard you're testing against, uh, your access to these tools, and how much of money you want to put into that. So work with whatever work best for your team. Um, for me, like I use many of these tools. The web tool, I, I like using it just because it's easy uh, to interpret. I can run it quickly while I'm working and I don't need to wait on a report to be generated. Um, but yeah, you can work with any tool. Thank you. Any other questions or clarifications?
See, I missed that. Your voice was breaking for me. Uh, hi, Vinod. We are not able to hear you. Any question? Any other question, guys? So hope no. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Iswak. I think you have so, covered uh, everything well. If any question, we will get back. Hmm. So thanks a lot for your time, and it's very it was very nice. So we haven't uh, uh, thought about this accessibility stuff, but henceforth I think we will implement. Thanks for this uh, knowledge sharing. It's my pleasure as always, and thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for joining today. Hope you have a pleasant rest of your day. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, if I was Bob, uh, you'll be having many sessions with us. Thank you as thank always. You.